so indeed we turn to the third great end of the church, the maintenance of divine worship. We're going to be talking about worship in the content uh, of the presence of a worshiping community. So how do we define it? Well, I think the 20th century mystic Christian um, Evelyn Underhill gives us a place to start in her definition of what worship is. She writes, quote, the absolute knowledge, acknowledgement, excuse me, of all that lies beyond us, the glory that fills heaven and earth. It is the response that conscious beings make to their creator, to the eternal reality from which they came forth. Worship to God, however they may think of God or recognize God, or whether God be realized through religion, through nature, through history, through science, art, or human life and character." Close quote. Worship asserts the reality of the divine and our human connection to that which is wholly other, and yet still remains wholly integrated and ingrained in our very being. Worship is the way that we fulfill the first great commandment, which is to love God. To love God with our entire being, all that we are and all that we have. I always question about how do I really show love to God? Well, this is how we do it. This is what God hopes for, for that we'll return with a heart of thanksgiving, to come and to be together, to connect to that which is holy, beyond us and within us. And from that place of thanksgiving, go forward and serve in God's name. Indeed, for us, God does have a name, and God is known. We know God is the holy and intimate one of Israel. We know God by the name that was given through Moses of Yahweh, which translated means, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. In other words, I am about what's going on in this moment. It's about existence. It's about what we are together and the future towards which we move. And so we worship the same God that Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar worship, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah and Rachel. It's the God of Moses and all of the prophets. It's the God of Jesus of Nazareth, the God who was present with us through the Holy Spirit, still alive, still at work in the world. We worship the God of all history in our time-space continuum. The God of the present, which has now also by saying the word has become the past as we move in the future that's going to be the next moment, which now is already the present. A God who moves with us in all time to create in us new life, to redeem us in a life of freedom in Christ, and sustain us with all the gifts necessary for enjoying life and enjoying God forever. We worship a God of particularity, indeed a God who does create and liberates and sustains, a God who still speaks, a God who still can be heard through events and through people, a God who continues to think flesh in Jesus of Nazareth, so that we might become more fully and more completely human. I guess to define worship in its simplest terms, we worship what we bow down to and what we serve. True worship then becomes that role and that action of moving ourselves out of the center of the universe and allowing a greater desire and passion to overwhelm us, to teach us, to lead us, to push us deeper into trust and into service towards God's greater good, God's greater vision of healing and mending creation through acts of compassion and justice and peace. We would say really that we have been created with a worship, a worship gene. In other words, worship is a part of our DNA. We can't have life without worship. The only problem arises when we decide that we've become confused in our worship and we may be worshiping the wrong thing. When we bow down and serve God's other than God, Yahweh. When we worship gods of our own creating, gods who may seem a little bit more attractive or pleasing or passive 
or even less demanding. This is what we call idolatry. And it's a constant struggle that is detailed in our biblical narrative. All know the story of the golden calf? The story of Moses going up into the mountains high to receive the instructions from God as the story unfolds about how God's going to fashion and form this new covenant community to live in all faithfulness of worship and faithfulness and justice in the world and in community. Well, the people in the valley below, they're restless. They wonder where Moses is. Why hasn't he come back yet? You know, we always want the answer right now. And so it was a short period of time when Aaron stands up and says, okay, I can settle this problem. Let's all just bring all of our gold forward and I'll melt it and we'll make it into the golden calf. Remember? And they all bow down and worship that. Glorious image that they could see and hold on to and worship apart from God. Or even Jesus, we know, he, we hear him say to us that we cannot worship God and mammon or money at the same time. And so we are left at this place of realizing that when we start to begin hearing a God, a God that only agrees with every one of our ideas, and never has any argument with us at all, it must be a God that we have created in our own age. This is why the great end of the church has come to us, that we are to, to maintain divine worship so that we don't lose our way and lose the focus for why God gathers us in this place of loving God today. Worshiping God is not about satisfying our needs, but it's about bowing down to and serving what ends God needs to be realized in creation through us. And so we say in worship in the Reformed tradition, again, is a place where we gather to observe and share in the signs and symbols of the sacraments of the font and table, but also the pulpit, the sign also of God's grace in word bringing message to us that we hear, respond, and follow today. We know it's easy to slip into self-satisfying worship and self-serving worship instead of worshiping God. Theologian Sohan Kierkegaard wrote a piece on this called The Theater of Worship. He was troubled what he was seeing in the churches where in which people in the congregation saw themselves as the audience. And those of us up here in the front, who do most of the talking, I agree, as those who were the actors acting for you. And so like after any good stage play, you wonder, well, was the acting good or was it not? Kierkegaard said, we've got it all wrong. There's only one audience in worship. Who's the audience in worship? Uh -huh. That's right. And I am just up here as a coach, maybe at best, leading us so that we together can offer the best of our love and thanksgiving to God. And so the questions of worship are not, did I get anything out of worship or did I like it? But was God pleased with my worship today? Was God pleased with what we together did in this room? Did I find my ways to say thank you to God? Was I challenged by God to be a better person, a better follower of Jesus? Did I bow down to God? Did I make any promises or vows to the way I will serve or do better and differently this week? This is why we call what we do together here the liturgy word at its essence means the work of the people. So all of these words on the pavement are to drive us to do the work of godly worship. Well this brings us then to this marvelous as yet haunting encounter within the Gospel of Luke. It's a story which sets up this very dichotomy between being rich toward self and being rich toward God and the blindness of our hearts and minds and spirits as to the greater vision and desires of our God. Well, so often is the case, somebody within the crowd comes to Jesus with a question. And this is the way in which Jesus taught was out of the Socratic method, which is was dealing with questions and answers that would initiate some kind of debate pursuit of greater theological content in our lives 
and then impact our practice of faith in the community. Sometimes Jesus asked the question, but more often not questions were asked of Jesus. But what we find out is that Jesus, when he's asked the question, rarely ever asks, answers that particular question. He always shifts the congregation or the person asking to a greater dimension in life. And so that's what happens in the story. What was the question? Somebody felt cheated out of the inheritance. Like that's a new story? We either know it in our own lives or we've heard other people talking about it. There's nothing more that rips up people's lives and families it is what's the content of the will. So I hope all of you have yours well in place. But what does Jesus say to the question? I'm not getting in the middle of that, basically, is what he says. Who may be a judge or arbitrator? I'm not going to enter into that. But what I will do is ask a more important question. And it is about security. It's really about what are we worshiping. And so Jesus lifts us into that question this morning. Be aware of all kinds of greed. And as we know from Scripture, greed is another word for idolatry. In other words, it's the false worship. For Jesus says our security, our value, our worth do not come from a balance sheet or a bank statement or the abundance of possessions. Even though the world around us tries to convince us that's where it's to be found. And so we hear the story of the landowner, a rich landowner. He wasn't a farmer. He just owned the land. And so what we know from the story instantly is that this was a very rich man. And we would consider what we're talking about these days as the 1%. And so he wasn't a farmer. He just was a, a landowner. And the land produces abundantly. And so he gets this windfall, this huge crop. You might say he won the lottery. I always hear people say, well, I'm going to win the lottery. I'm going to, and I'm coming to get you to those who I've heard promise. So. <laughs> but see, the problem here is not money. Jesus doesn't have any problem with money. He really doesn't. He also doesn't have any problem about talking about it in church, and neither do we. His problem is how we view it, or how we hide it, <coughs> excuse me, or particularly, how we use it. And so we listen to this rich man's plans. And we hear in contrast to last week, what was the pronoun that we're, the pronoun we're supposed to live by? Second person plural possessive. Our. Does the man ever use the word our? <coughs> occasion after occasion, every sentence is filled with I and my. And so what he saw was something simply only about him. Not about others and certainly not about God. So what does he do on this question of security in life? He calls a stock broker so that he might purchase some more, what do they call them? Security. Securities. We even call them securities, right? So the question for Jesus is, what are we worshiping? Is our worship self-oriented? Is it about I? Is it about my? Or is our worship of God and directed there? Are we being rich to ourselves or are we being rich toward God in thanksgiving and generosity toward others? <clears throat> are we loving self more than we're loving God in our neighbor? I sense the landowner really didn't have a clue, and I think that's a part of our social economic strategies in this society we live in too. We don't acknowledge ourselves often as privileged, but we are. We're extremely privileged. And as God looks to the world or even beyond that, we all are in the one percent. And so the farm owner, he couldn't see anybody beyond himself because he thought this was all about him. He hadn't done anything to get this bounty, but he was the recipient. I don't think you probably thought about the farm workers who pick the crops, who work the fields, or about the millions of people who have to scrounge for their daily bread. What well, can I do this with this for me? 
just when we're feeling so self-secure, so self-assured, what does God say to this man, man but you fool? You inherit the grapes of God's wrath. Death always has a way of clarifying what reality matters to us and to God. Now let's be clear, God does want us to save for retirement. God does want us to take care of our present and future needs. This is what it means to be a wise steward. It's not that God doesn't want us to eat, drink, and be merry. But we see God in Christ as one who loved to spend time with his friends, drinking and eating and enjoying life together. But Jesus was also very clear about what his pure, where his true security lay. It was in God and nothing that he had possessed. Jesus' story is about perspective and priorities, seeing the needs of others as clearly and as dearly as we see our own. It's about who is our God and who is the Lord of our lives. Our lives, our possessions, and our worship are not our own. They belong to God. We are merely temporary stewards of the treasures for the time that God has given us on this good earth. The use of our money clarifies which God we worship. And so as Jesus asks of us, are we rich to ourselves or are we being rich towards God? May we live into that question today in the days of this week.